Um, welcome to our third presentation about the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals Program and Initial Applications. My name is Adonia Simpson. I direct the Family Defense Program at Americans for Im Immigrant Justice, and I'm joined by... Hi, my name is Orieta Lopez. I am the Legal Assistant for the Family Defense Program, and follow along because we're going to be talking about uh, information how to file your DACA. Excellent. And if you haven't already, please make sure to watch parts one and two um, of our videos. Um, those go over the eligibility requirements and gathering the evidence. Once you know that you're eligible and you have all the evidence, you can proceed to, to proceeding with the application. However, we do encourage you to make sure that you speak to an attorney just to confirm everything and to make sure that you don't have any other options that may be better than DACA. So we're gonna go ahead and get started and let's talk about the application process. So as you all learned previously, evidence is crucial in this, particularly regarding presence, but also to establish all of the elements for eligibility. And we're not gonna cover those today. Today, what we wanna go over is the forms and the actual process of applying. So um, even though there is no policy that applications will be rejected if, if any, any of the spaces on the forms are blank, we really do encourage you to make sure that all spaces are completed. It's just a really good way to ensure that you have um, addressed every single question and that uh, you're not missing any information. So first of all, if you're working with an attorney, an attorney is gonna be submitting a G28, which is the entry of appearance. Um, but if you're applying pro se, which means if you're applying without an attorney, you're not going to need to do the G28 form. So first, let's go ahead and talk about the I-821D, which we're going to open up right here, and is the application for DACA. So we're just going to quickly review this and just give you some practice tips and pointers as far as the best way to have this um, form completed. So first of all, if this is your first application for DACA, you are going to be checking that this is an initial request. Um, for some reason, if you've allowed your DACA to lapse um, for more than a year, you also will be indicating that this is an initial request. It would not be a renewal. And we talked about that on an earlier presentation. So next, make sure to enter your full legal name. Um, and this is the way that your name will appear on your, on your work authorization. Make sure everything matches up. Make sure there's no typos or spelling errors, just to ensure there's no issues between your application, your work authorization, and your social security card. So mailing address. Mailing address is where you want all notices and your work authorization to be sent. This doesn't need to be your home address where you physically reside. So perhaps there's a place that you know that you're gonna safely receive mail. Um, there's gonna be some really important documents coming to you. So you wanna make sure that your mailing address is one that you have no issues receiving any communication uh, via the US Postal Service. So if it is, um, if you have a family member or a friend or perhaps even a PO box, um, enter that in your US mailing address. Next, really important thing, have you, are, if you're now or have you ever been in removal proceedings or do you have a removal order against you? Um, something that I often see happen on applications for DACA for Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals is oftentimes applicants when they were really young, they actually did encounter immigration at entry and they may actually have a removal order from, from maybe a dozen years ago. Um, so if there, are, you know, make sure you're double checking that, that there was no contact with immigration at any point. If there was, it might be a good idea to do something called a Freedom of Information Act request, which is to get a copy of all the immigrant files and documents regarding, uh, regarding your, your case, um, which is extremely helpful just to ensure that there's no issues. I've seen a lot of cases where people don't realize they have a removal order and they check no here and we have to go back later just to correct the record and make sure that it's very clear that this was just a, a mistake and an oversight and that there was in fact a removal case in the past and perhaps a final order of removal. So if there was any proceedings currently going on or have in the past, make sure to indicate it, what the situation is, were the proceedings terminated, was there a final order of removal, Oftentimes when people don't appear in immigration court, they are issued a removal order in absentia, which means without, not in your presence. 
So there is a chance if you were supposed to go to court many, many years ago and never appeared that you may have a final order of removal. So all the more reason to speak to an attorney to see what any sort of consequences are and if it might be better to do a Freedom of Information Act request to get all of the documents. Also, in order to answer these questions about the dates of proceedings and locations, a FOIA might be really helpful in getting that information. Okay, next is the A number. Um, it's a nine digit number. If you have ever applied for an immigration benefit or had contact with immigration, you likely have an A number. Um, if not, that's completely fine. You can leave that blank. One will be issued to you upon processing of your application. This A number is really important. It's your immigration file identification number. So it follows you everywhere. It'll be on your work authorization. It will be on all your receipts. Um, if you ever have to communicate with immigration, it's a really important number to have. So if you have one, you wanna include it. If you don't, that's completely fine. Um, if you think you might've been in proceedings, but you're not sure, you might have an A number, which again is all the more reason to perhaps do a Freedom of Information Act request to get that information. If you have had a social security number in the past, you can indicate it here. Many people don't, that's completely fine. You can leave it blank. Um, next, your date of birth, um, make sure that you're double checking that. I've had some cases where people reverse the, the month and day. Um, just make sure you're putting month, day, year for your date of birth. Um, gender, so next indicate the city, town of your birth, your country of birth, your current country of residence is gonna be the United States of America because that's where you're currently residing. Um, also indicate um, your country of citizenship or nationality. This actually, a lot of people do have dual citizenship. So you could be putting two different countries if you are a dual citizen for any reason. Next, indicate your marital status. Um, make sure if you were married in the past and divorced, you're divorced um, as, as opposed to single. Um, if you um, are married, check married, um, and this is a legal marriage. So if you have a long-term partner and maybe you have a family together, but you're not legally married, you would either indicate single or divorce depending on what the situation is. Next, if you've ever used any other names, um, sometimes we've seen clients who may have used a different name at entry um, when they were coming into the United States or for various other reasons, maybe used a different name, make sure to indicate it here. Um, if you have any, um, you should definitely speak to an attorney if that's the case. We just wanna make sure there's no other issues that may impact your eligibility, um, not just for DACA, but for future forms of relief, depending on what information was attached to that name. Um, ethnicity, race, height, weight, eye color, hair, just go ahead and click that um, to the best of your, of however you identify. Um, so next, we're getting into the, the meat of the application. That was just all biographic background information. Now we're actually going to get into the part of the application that's about your eligibility. So first of all, you have to, to indicate, and this is all based on the eligibility that we did in parts one and two of our videos. But um, so first of all, you have to confirm that you've continuously resided in the United States since June 15th, 2007. Um, if you've had any brief innocent absences from the United States um, during that time, make sure you talk to an attorney, make sure that there's no issue regarding your eligibility in that regards. So you'll check yes, um, if that is the case. And um, I recommend before you start an application, really go back and try to think out a timeline uh, because you do need to provide all your addresses um, since uh, June 15th, 2007. Um, so go ahead and write those out. And not only is it the addresses, it's the time frame. And if you don't know exact dates, that's okay. Do it to the best of your estimation. If you think it was in January of 2009, you could say January 1, 2009. Um, just to the best of your ability, think out all the places that you've lived at and resided at since the date in uh, since June 15, 2007. There is an additional page on the application. So if you've moved around a lot, um, you may have to use the final page to fill in any of the missing addresses. And you're gonna start off with the most current, your present address. So where are you at right now? And then work your way backwards. Odie, any tips on this? 
Um, I've seen that a lot of people, you know, since they came here when they were younger, they don't know their addresses. So, you know, make sure to ask your parents. I'm sure there's probably any old documents lying around that would be helpful that could help with this. Absolutely. And that could also be evidenced um, to prove your physical presence. So if you don't have a lot of evidence showing your time here, if there is some documentation showing your address, well, hey, that shows your physical presence. All right. And next, um, we mentioned briefly about absences um, since June 15th, 2007. If you did take any departures within that time, you'll have to put it here. Again, please talk to an attorney because if it wasn't a brief and casual innocent departure from the United States, it could break that physical presence that you need for eligibility. And the last thing we want you to do is to submit an application that you may not be eligible for. So if there's been any departures since that date in 2007, speak to an attorney. Um, and if um, this probably won't apply to applicants, initial DACA applicants, but for some reason, if you were able to get advanced parole and you traveled outside of the United States after August 15th, 2012, um, you would need to indicate that. Um, next, put down what um, your passport information, if you have one. Um, if, you, if it's expired, go ahead and put it down. We do recommend um, that, that you have an unexpired passport unless there's some concerns um, about obtaining the passport from, from the country or any sort of issues. For example, Venezuela, it's, it's impossible to get passports at this time. So you may have an expired passport. All right, so part three is for all the folks that are applying for the very first time. Um, so you have to attest that you arrived in the United States and established residence before turning 16 years of age. As we discussed in the eligibility video, if this happened after, after if you entered after 16, unfortunately you are not eligible. And you're gonna have to prove that entry that you were here before you were 16. 16 years of age. Um, so to the best of your ability, put your entry date. A lot of folks may not know the exact date. Perhaps they crossed um, without permission and didn't encounter immigration. So there's no exact date of entry. So just do, a, to the best of your ability, an estimation. Um, if you entered on a visa, you'll have that information. You should have that information in your passport and an I-94 where you can also get that information. It also indicate where you entered. Um, again, if you entered um, with family without authorization, um, just to the best of your ability, if it was near somewhere in Texas, you know, say where it was near in Texas um, or wherever else it may be. For folks that entered on a visa, just indicate the airport, um, the U.S. airport um, that you traveled into. All right, next, another eligibility requirement is that you did not have any lawful status on the date of the announcement of DACA, which was June 15th, 2012. Um, so, so you wanna confirm um, that you had no lawful status or you had an expired status, and it gives you some examples of what you can indicate um, here. If you did have status on that date, um, it, is, it is likely that you're not eligible for DACA, so make sure that you're talking to an attorney to confirm whether that's the case or not. Um, if you entered on a visa, um, you were likely issued a 994. Um, if you were issued one, you would indicate yes and put in the information if you have it. There are ways to get that information if for some reason you've lost your I-94 or you don't know what happened to it. Um, there are certain ways um, either through Freedom of Information Act requests or an I-102 to replace your, your, your I-94 document. There are ways to get it um, if you don't have it. So make sure you're speaking to an attorney. All right, moving on. Um, education information. Um, it, you have to indicate um, where, where you are currently um, receiving your education or where you received your education in the past, um, the city, the name, the city and state um, where, where this is happening and a date of graduation or if you're currently in school, the last date of attendance. So right now, um, if you're on break from school, the last day of attendance would be your winter, the last day of classes for winter. Um, if you're currently in school, um, you would indicate that you're currently in school. Odi, any tips on that? Um, you covered everything. 
All right, awesome. Uh, for some reason, if you um, were in the military service, you can indicate that here. Um, we don't see a whole lot of um, DACA applicants that were in the US Armed Forces given some recent policies, but it could happen um, and it could be the case. So if that does apply to you, make sure you're filling in all the branch and service uh, dates and discharge information. All right. Next part four is doing the assessment as to whether or not somebody is eligible based on any sort of interactions with law enforcement or as a matter of discretion. So it's really important to be extremely honest here. If you, if the, any of these things do potentially apply to you, please, please, please speak to an attorney or a Department of Justice accredited representative. Um, we wanna ensure that there's no issues proceeding with an application, um, that there's but there's nothing that could put you at danger of being um, being placed on immigration's radar. So first of all, have you ever been arrested, charged with, or convicted of a felony or misdemeanor? Um, so this is any instance. Um, if you've ever been put in handcuffs, if you've ever had to go to court, um, if you have concerns about this, again, speak to an attorney. Um, it's better. It's better to air the information and speak it out with a legal professional to see if there's any issues as opposed to submitting an application. And again, um, part of the application process that we're gonna talk about later is biometrics where they're gonna do fingerprints and they are gonna run it through. So if there has been any time that you've been fingerprinted, this will show up on the, the background checks that they do. So, um, so if you have any concerns about any interactions with law enforcement in the past, make sure you talk to a professional. Um, so have you, and then question two is about any arrest, charge, or conviction outside of the United States. Um, indicate um, whether this applies or not. If for any reason either of these questions um, you answer in the affirmative, you do need to get um, certified court dispositions and the charging documents. And again, this can be quite a process um, and there may be no issue at all, but it's always better to be safe and sorry and speak to an attorney to make sure there's no issues. All right, next is just the other laundry list of, of issues um, that they're looking for as a matter of discretion. If there's any um, engagement in terrorist activities and gang activities, um, if you've ever participated in any of the following, torture, genocide, human trafficking, um, we're hoping these should all be no's. Um, if there's any issues, make sure that you're talking to an attorney. Um, so just read through these and make sure to answer them honestly. Um, and we're gonna jump on to part five. Um, if you are able to read and understand English, you would put click this box for some reason. If you are using an interpreter, um, you would indicate it 1B and indicate the language with the, which with which the interpretation was provided. Okay, you are the requester. You are the person that is applying for the benefit. And please note that here, when you sign this, you are certifying that under the pains and penalty of perjury, that everything in the application is true. So if you do receive assistance from um, somebody else in completing this application, it really is on you to review it and ensure that all the information is correct because when you, the moment that you sign this and submit this to immigration, you are certifying that it is in fact the truth. Um, so you would sign here, and we're gonna talk about signatures here in a little bit, about how, um, what sort of signatures are being accepted right now during the pandemic, um, but we'll talk about that later. But you're gonna sign, date, and then this is all your information, um, your daytime phone number, mobile phone number, email address. Um, if you did use an interpreter, that information of the person providing the interpretation will need to complete part six with all of his or her information. And then, um, and then the interpreter will also need to sign. So it's not just a matter of somebody interpreting for you, they actually have to sign off on it and provide their information. Part seven is for the preparer. So this is somebody, if somebody other than yourself is completing the application on your behalf, but you are reviewing it and signing off on it after you've thoroughly reviewed it, um, the preparer's information goes in here. Oftentimes this will be an attorney or a Department of Justice accredited representative. Um, and this person will, if they've completed the application on their, your behalf, they'll fill in their information, their organization or business name, their address, um, and also sign off on it. 
And as I mentioned earlier, you may have more um, addresses than there are space for in the application. So this is where you can provide that additional information with the page number and the part and the item number um, that you need to provide additional information on. Um, any of the other questions that you answered that requires an explanation, um, any of the yes, no questions where it says if you check yes, you must explain, this is also where you would put that explanation. So um, that is the actual I-821D, which is the application for DACA. Um, next, we're gonna jump on and talk, to the, talk about the actual application for a work permit, which is your work authorization document. Um, this form is the I-765, um, and it's gotten a lot longer in the last couple of years than it used to be. Um, so just make sure you're thoroughly reviewing all the information. Um, if this is the first time, and then this will likely, if this is your first time applying for DACA, um, you are likely applying for work authorization for the first time. Um, so you're gonna click here for initial permission to accept employment. Um, employment. Um, and again, just like your DACA application, you're gonna put your full legal name, double check spelling, make sure that everything is correct. Again, if you've ever used any other name, you can put it in here. Again, US mailing address, that's the address that you want your document, your work authorization document sent to. Again, I can't stress enough that this needs to be a safe address uh, where you have no issues receiving mail. Um, work authorizations often come in a very distinctive envelope, um, so, so they are very um, important. So you wanna ensure that you receive it. So indicate your US mailing address. And again, this does not have to be your actual physical home address. This is just where you want the information sent. And again, here's the US physical address. So this is where you actually reside. So these may be two different um, addresses or it could be the same address. All right, again, A number, if you have one, you can put it in here. If you don't, don't worry about it. Also number nine, don't worry about it. It's unlikely that you have an online account number. Um, the rest of these biographic questions are very similar to the I-821D application. Next, um, has the Social Security Administration ever issued you a Social Security card? If you had, um, on your 821D application, if you have had a Social Security number um, that was issued to you by the Social Security Administration, you would be checking yes here and then putting the number. If not, just check no. Next, um, a, a tip that I really do have for you, um, you have an option now on the work authorization application to have your information once approved, sent over to the Social Security Administration for them to actually issue you a Social Security card. Um, I really do recommend you doing that, particularly now during the pandemic. Otherwise, there's quite a bit of a process of having to go into the Social Security Administration with your work authorization document to get the card issued to you. So it's much more quick um, to actually just have your information sent on to have it issued. Um, the disclaimer on that is that there, you have to consent and you have to provide some additional information. And if it's information that you're not comfortable doing, that's completely fine. Um, you'll just need to go in in person um, to have the social security card issued. Um, so you have to authorize disclosure of this information. As I mentioned, if you don't want this to happen, you would check no. Um, if you answered yes, if you do want the Social Security Administration to receive your information and issue you a card, you would click yes to this, which now means that you need to provide this information um, for items number 16A to 17B, which is your parents' information, um, which is your mother and father's information. Um, so if you have any concerns about providing their names, um, this would be something you might want to speak to an attorney about. Again, your countries of citizenship or nationality. This form allows for separate entry if you have citizenship in more than one country, and you would indicate it there. Place of birth, very similar to the I-821D, city, town, country, and uh, date of birth. Again, just like the 821D, you're gonna have a lot of this information already since you already filled it out on the form earlier, but it's gonna ask for an I-94 number. If you have one, if you um, were issued an I-94 upon entry on a visa 
or parole. Um, it's going to ask for your passport um, information, your, your most recently issued passport, and when it expires, your date of last arrival and your status of last arrival. So if you entered without inspection, that means without any sort of permission from the government, you can put entered without inspection or no status. Um, if you entered on a visa, you would indicate what type of visa you entered on. All right. So moving on, a uh, big thing to keep in mind, um, every work authorization um, is based on some sort of immigration benefit or immigration status. Um, so to indicate the status that your work authorization is based on, you have to indicate an eligibility category. For DACA, it's C33. So this is incredibly important. You're gonna wanna click C33. That's your DACA eligibility category. Uh, please note, there's a lot of sections that don't apply for you um, if you're applying under the work authorization category of C33. So for example, question 28, you can skip that, um, all the subparts. Question 29, similarly, you can skip that. Question 30, you can also skip that and all of its subparts. And then we are moving on to question 31. Also, you can skip that. It's not applicable to C33 um, and all the subparts of 31. And look at that. The whole page you pretty much didn't need to complete. Um, so next, um, you're attesting that you can read and understand English. Similarly to the H21D, if you did use interpretation, you would wanna click this and indicate who um, provided the interpretation. Also, if you had somebody um, prepare the application for you, um, you and you were again reviewing it and signing off on it and attesting that everything is correct, you would indicate um, that someone has prepared this for you. Um, applicant, you are the applicant, so this is your contact information, your phone number, email address. Um, and then moving on, and this is where you're gonna sign. And again, I can't stress this enough. Um, if you have somebody else completing your application, please make sure to review it and make sure that everything's correct. And if you have questions, um, make sure that you're asking them. Um, and if there's something that is incorrect, make sure it has been corrected before you submit it to immigration. Um, part four is for an interpreter. If you used an interpreter to complete the form, all of their, his or her contact information indicating the language of interpretation. And again, that individual, individual will sign off on it. Part five is for a preparer. Um, if somebody completed the application on your behalf, um, his or her information will go here. If the person that is um, an attorney, um, they would need to complete that they're an attorney or a DOJ accredited representative and whether or not their representation of you extends beyond just the submission of the application. Um, if it's a non-attorney, um, they really need to click here that they are not an attorney or accredited representative, um, but, they, but they received consent um, to prepare the application on your behalf. And then again, prepare signs here. And that is your application for work authorization. Similar to the I-821D, there is an additional page for information. Um, it's unlikely that you would need to complete this part um, given the responses for a DACA application. Whew, we're almost done folks, I swear. Oh goodness, um, hold on one second. All right, so next, another thing that's very unique to applying for DACA is the I-765 worksheet or WS. And we're gonna go ahead and jump to that and it's an interesting little form. Um, pretty much you just need to put your name, your estimated annual income, your estimated annual expenses and any assets. Um, and then again, an explanation as to why um, you need work authorization. Um, you know, generally the applications that we complete, we indicate that, um, you know, folks want to help out with their families or they're continuing their education. Um, Odie, what are some of the explanations that you've seen? Yeah, um, sometimes people think that they have to kind of write their whole life story, but you don't have to do that. You can, you know, pretty much all of the renewals that we do, most people just indicate that they want to pay for school, pay for their expenses. Um, a lot of DACA recipients help out their family with bills, so they indicate that as well. Um, that's pretty much the gist of what everybody talks about, but everybody's situation is different. So if your situation is a little different, you can feel free to explain why you need a work permit. 
exactly. Um, and this is just a quick form that just attaches on um, with your application for your 765 for your work authorization. You don't need to sign it, um, but just complete it to the best of your ability. All right, another optional form is this G1145, which is a form so you would receive um, e-notification of your application being accepted. Um, if you do want this email um, notification, electronic notification, just make sure to complete this form and submit it with your application. Um, so those are the forms. Um, so we reviewed all of those. As I mentioned earlier, I wanted to talk to you about signatures. Um, right now during the pandemic, um, USCIS or US Citizenship and Immigration Service is allowing for electronically reproduced signatures. What, what that means is like a scan or a photocopy of your actual signature. So if you're working with an attorney or a Department of Justice accredited representative, um, they may ask you to sign off on the application and scan and email them a copy. Um, that's completely fine. Um, we do need to maintain um, a copy. The original signature does need to be maintained. What USCIS will not accept is like an Adobe electronic signature where you like type in your name as your signature. That unfortunately is not sufficient. Um, that an application where you do use a computer program to sign your application will be rejected. Uh, but if you sign it physically and scan it or take a picture of it um, or fax it, um, that is an acceptable signature right now during the pandemic. Um, Ori, do you wanna talk about filing fees and the rest of what people need to be submitting? Yes. yes. So in order to turn in your DACA application, you need to submit it with the filing fee, which is $495. So you can either submit a check, a money order, or a G1450 credit card authorization. Unfortunately for DACA, there isn't any waivers, but if you truly feel like you can't pay for the application, let's say you're homeless or your situation is just too difficult right now to uh, pay for the filing fee, make sure to speak to an attorney and they can let you know of what options might be available for you. Um, you will also need to turn in two passport photos along with the application as well. Where can folks get passport photos? You can either, well, there's several options. Um, there's apps that you can download on your phone. And if you have a printer, a photo printer, you can print them out that way. Or you can go to your local CVS or Walgreens just to let them know that you need a passport photo and they'll be able to provide you with one. Awesome. Thanks, Wadi. All right. Um, so depending on where you live, there's specific places where you need to mail your application. For Floridians, um, you'll be mailing it to the USCIS lockbox um, in Dallas, Texas. Um, but let's talk about once the application has been submitted, um, there's some things that are going to happen. Um, first of all, you're going to get receipt notices. You'll get receipt notices for both your 821D, your DACA application, and your 765, your work, um, your work authorization. Um, those receipt numbers will be, there'll be numbers on the top of your application on the receipt notice. Um, the receipt notice will also indicate what date your application was received. These receipt notices are extremely important. Um, as, a, as a caveat, it's important to note that due to the pandemic, things are taking longer to process. So it could take four to six weeks to actually receive that notice uh, from USCIS indicating that they accepted your application. If there's any significant issues with your application, if something's unsigned um, or there's anything missing from the application, they could reject the application, which means that they'll send the whole thing back to you um, indicating what the issue is. So we see this happen a lot um, for payment issues, um, or for signature issues. Um, so again, if you can, please work with an attorney or Department of Justice accredited representative in preparing and submitting your application. After you receive the, the, the receipt notice, um, you are gonna get a biometrics appointment notice. Um, so this is gonna be, it's gonna indicate a location, um, one of the locations near you where you can go in um, to get your fingerprints taken. Um, make sure that you have some sort of photo identity um, photo ID or proof of identity documents um, because they will check that when you're going in. Uh, if you have any concerns around COVID and going in um, to one of these centers, um, keep in mind they are 
really um, restricting the number of people that are in at any time and PPE is required. Um, but if you do have concerns, you can always contact USCIS customer service um, to see about having that appointment rescheduled. However, if the appointment is rescheduled, that just means that it's gonna take longer for your application to be processed. Um, during the process, um, if USCIS identifies any deficiencies in your application, meaning that maybe they need more evidence on one of the eligibility requirements, you may get something called a request for evidence, um, which will give you a certain amount of time to respond. Um, and it's really important that um, if you receive one of these um, to really look at it very critically, make sure that all the information that is being requested um, is being provided. A failure to respond to a request for evidence means that your application can be denied. Um, and there's no refunds. If your application is denied, uh, immigration will keep the processing, the filing fee uh, for processing the application. While your application is pending, if you want to check on the status of your application, you're more than able to do so. There's a website. If you just Google search um, USCIS case status, um, it'll, it'll pop up a, a link to a website um, through make sure it's USCIS.gov. Even if you enter in your receipt no notice, it will give you the most um, usually the most current uh, status of your application. If you put in your receipt number for your work authorization, it's also really good because once um, you're approved and your work authorization document is being produced and issued, it'll actually provide the USPS tracking number um, where you can see where your work authorization is and confirm its delivery. Um, so as I mentioned, approval, you'll receive an approval for your deferred action for childhood arrivals and a work authorization document. Make sure that you're reviewing it, that everything on it is spelled correctly. Um, if there is an error on your work authorization document and it's of no fault of your own, you spelled everything correctly on the application, you have to send it back in order to get a new one, um, a new one issued. If the error is on your part because or the, the person preparing the application's fault and there was an, a spelling error on the actual application, this is really problematic because you will actually have to pay for a new document to be issued. So that's why we really caution you, double check, double check, double check, make sure everything is spelled correctly. Um, and as we mentioned earlier, if you elected to, to have immigration send your information onto the Social Security Administration, you will also, once approved, subsequently get a Social Security card, um, which you can present along with your work authorization card for employment. Um, it's also really important to keep your address up to date. Um, as we saw with the recent litigation, um, there was a lot of changes and USCIS was issuing updated notices for extensions on work authorizations and that was being sent to the last address on file. Um, so it's important to keep your address up to date. Um, if you just Google AR11, that's the form to, to change your address and there's a way to do it online very easily through USCIS's website. Uh, just make sure to keep it up to date in case there's any important um, information coming from USCIS. And again, if anything in your personal circumstances change, you get married, you're a victim of a crime, you have an interaction with law enforcement, you have an interaction with immigration, please speak to an immigration attorney to see if this changes any of your eligibility options, um, not just for DACA, but for other, other programs or relief um, from immigration. So, um, you know, if you haven't spoken to an attorney in a while, it's a good time to just get in, get in once a year and check in to see if your circumstances have changed. I recommend that to all clients. Um, you never know when there's been a change in law or policy or your circumstances that could really benefit you. Um, and then last thing, just a reminder, once you do have your DACA, um, it will be good for two years. Um, consider renewing um, 120 to 150 days before your expiration, just so there's, there's no lapse. Um, and again, if circumstances change, please talk to an attorney. Ori, do you wanna? Yeah. Take the last one? <laughs> yes. So if you have any doubts or if you want any help of, with preparing your application, any questions that you might have, you can feel free to reach out to us and we can help you out with that. So to call us, it's 305-573-1106, extension 1400. 
leave a message. So from there, you'll speak to the receptionist and she'll transfer you to the appropriate department. If it happens to be our department for DACA, just leave a message with your name and your number and we will reach out to you for the intake. All right, thank you. Thank you for tuning in and reach out to us if you need help. Thank you.